Thank you for everyone joining us today. Today is our installment of Wild Sarasota, Cunning Coyotes. So and once again, I'm Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator at University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Sarasota County. And I do a variety of programming, most of it focused around wildlife, conservation, uh, native plants, and our uh, Florida ecosystem. So I do programs for both adults and children and um, often out in the field prior to COVID, but during our COVID restrictions, uh, doing a lot of these webinars and classes online. We also have a number of videos posted at our Sarasota County Extension YouTube um, channel. So you can check out my videos or some of our other uh, staff videos as well, if you'd like to learn more there. All of these are recorded, as Adelaide said, and posted to YouTube eventually, not always right away, but within a couple weeks at the latest. So please feel free to check out any of these Wild Sarasota programs that you might have missed. All right. And oh, I am going to ask you guys a question right now. So you should see a poll show up on your screen. It's a multiple choice question about what is your experience with University of Florida IFAS Extension Sarasota County? So maybe you have called or visited our plant clinic. Maybe you have called or visited the extension office on Clark Road, which is the beautiful picture you see there. Um, I do believe that I forgot to allow you to choose all that apply. So if it only allows you to choose one, just choose the one that's your most common way that you interact with us. Perhaps you've taken a class with us virtually or in person. You might be a volunteer. I know some of you are. And you may be completely new to Sarasota County Extension. You may be visiting us today from somewhere other than Florida even. So I'll give people a couple minutes or a couple few more seconds. It looks like most of you have voted. So I'm gonna end the voting and I'll just share the results with y'all. It looks like most of you on today's call have taken another class with us, either virtually or in person. And we've got four people that are completely new to Sarasota County Extension. All right, so I am going to tell you a little bit more about what our office does. There is our beautiful office right there on Clark Road um, in Twin Lakes Park in Sarasota County. We are a LEED certified green building. So we have solar, we have a cistern, we have geothermal heating and air, um, as well as a beautiful native landscape that our master gardeners maintain. It's just a lovely building. And we do a variety of things out of our office. Uh, we are a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida, and the USDA. And there is an extension office in every county in Florida, as well as in all the states in our country, because they are associated with our land-grant universities. And the mission of county extension offices is to provide answers um, for problems that people are having or solutions. Uh, to assist them based on the science-based research done at the corresponding university. So programs at Sarasota County in agriculture, community development, gardening, natural resources, nutrition, and youth development, which of course is our 4-H program. So we have a variety of people that serve our community and provide education and information resources. So please feel free to contact us or the extension office in the area that you're in uh, if you need help in any of these areas. Here are just some of the programs that we do out of the Sarasota County Extension Office. So uh, sort of the top middle there, we have our Master Gardener logo. They are one of the largest programs at University of Florida IFAS. They are volunteers. We have a couple of them on the call today. Uh, they are volunteers that assist our community with all sorts of information on plants and gardening. Um, on the top right is the Florida Master Naturalist Program logo. And this is one of the programs that I teach and it is all about our amazing and unique Florida ecosystems. So please feel free, that's an adult education program. So please feel free to look into that if you're interested in more information. All right, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about coyotes, their natural history and how to identify them, how they came to Florida because they weren't always here. 
Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about the good, the bad, and the ugly of coyotes, because coyotes are one of those um, creatures, one of those wildlife predators that sometimes gets a bad reputation. So we're going to debunk some of those myths and talk about some of those realities. And then we're going to talk about how you can help avoid conflict or interaction with coyotes and who to contact if you do have further concerns. So here's my next question for you. We are going to answer how often you have seen a coyote in the wild here in Florida. So if you've seen a coyote, but it wasn't in Florida, there is an answer that says never in Florida, but elsewhere. So perhaps you've seen lots of coyotes, maybe once or twice, never in Florida, but elsewhere, or you never ever anywhere have seen a coyote out in the wild. So go ahead and finish voting. We've got almost everybody. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share the results with you. So almost half of the people on today's call have seen a coyote, just not in Florida. Um, so if you want to type into the chat box, if you're one of those people that answered you've seen a coyote elsewhere, go ahead and type into the chat box and tell us where you've seen a coyote. Uh, a couple people have seen coyotes many times, a few more people once or twice, and then six of you have never ever seen a coyote in the wild anywhere. All right, so we've got a good range there. Let me stop sharing that. And let's move on to talking about coyotes. So coyotes are a medium-sized member of the dog family. Uh, they are actually quite smaller than most people think. Uh, similar to if you were at our panther and bobcat webinar, we talked a little bit about how sometimes when you see a wild animal, especially if you see them around dusk or dawn and the lighting isn't really good, or you see them from far away and it's hard to sort of determine size. A lot of times in our brain, that animal gets a lot bigger than it is. And sometimes that's, that's just because we're not visually able to see it well or differentiate according to its surroundings, how big it really is. And sometimes it's because we're a little nervous about it. And so it just gets a little bit bigger in our brain. It's a very typical sort of reaction to have. Um, but they are pretty small. We're going to talk about how, um, how long and tall and how much they weigh in just a minute. Their color does vary from light to dark. This is a pretty light colored one, but a pretty average, I would say this is a pretty average looking coyote, although quite a beautiful specimen. Um, you can see they're sort of yellowish brown and then uh, the ends of some of their fur is sort of tipped with a darker color. Um, they have light colored throats and the undersides of their belly are more that whitish lighter color. They have large pointy ears. So, you know, if you look at the size of the ears of this coyote compared to its head, its ears are pretty long and pointy. Whereas with wolves, a lot of times, if you, you know, you probably would never see a wolf and a coyote next to each other. But if you did, or if you put two pictures next to each other, um, wolves ears compared to the size of their head are usually a little bit smaller and they're more rounded and not quite as triangular or point, pointy. Coyotes have a bushy tail with a black tip and they also, this is not something you'd, you'd really be able to see if you were looking at a coyote from afar, but they also have a black spot sort of on their back near the base of their tail and that's where their scent gland is located. And they tend to be most active at dawn and dusk. We call that crepuscular when animals are more active at that like change in um, lighting at both morning and evening. But although that is sort of their typical, their activity level really depends on where they are and what's going on around them, um, how they're able to find food or where they're able to find food. So you may see coyotes more active in the middle of the night in urban areas. And this can be because they're trying to avoid human activity and cars. So they'll become more active at night. Or perhaps it's a coyote that's eating their main diet at that point in time, either because of location or geography or 
um, season. They may be eating something that's more available during the day, and then you might see them in the middle of the day. So you really can see them at any point in time. I think this is a great graphic that sort of gives you an indication of the size of the coyote compared to other animals that you might be more familiar with in your head. So for instance, that sort of lightish gray um, silhouette of the dog in the very back that is the size of a Labrador Retriever. So I actually have two labs. So if I think about my dogs, a coyote is going to probably be smaller than them in terms of height and definitely way less um, weighty. So a coyote is going to be at least half the weight of my Labrador Retrievers. And then you can see the coyote, which is more the black outline compared to a fox. So fox are quite a bit smaller. And then you can see how big a cat is compared to a coyote. Um, so the average height at the shoulder of a coyote, so they are about two feet tall. Their average length is about three to four feet. It depends on uh, the, the resource you look at. Most of the resources I saw said three to four feet. Um, here we have an average length of 41 to 52 inches, which is a little bit, you know, more around four feet. And that includes their tail. Their average weight is 25 to 30 pounds, and males are larger than females usually. So you may see males upwards of 40 pounds, but the average is going to be closer for both males and females in that 25 to 30 pound range. Um, our coyotes here in the east are a bit larger than those out in the west. And gray wolves, in comparison, are quite a bit larger. They are going to be taller. They're going to be at least half a foot taller at their shoulder than the coyote. And they're going to be longer, five to six feet long. So that's quite a bit, um, quite a bit longer. And they're also quite a bit heavier. They're 80 to 120 pounds. So that is, you know, that's three to four times the weight, maybe even five times the weight of a coyote. So wolves, I have been near wolves in the wild and they are much larger than a coyote because I've also been near coyotes in the wild. Um, all right, so the FWC, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, over a couple year period from 2011 to 2013, did a study of coyote carcasses. So these were coyotes that had been hit by cars, um, maybe uh, had been found in some situation, and they collected over those couple years, 149 different coyotes, and they weighed them, they measured them. So they collected a lot of data about what the average coyote in Florida um, in terms of size and also in terms of what they're eating, which we'll talk about in a minute. So here you see this graph from the FWC where um, the yellow is the female coyotes and the male is, or the gray is the male coyotes. So you can see that the largest number of both male and female coyotes are right around this 25 to 30 pound range. Um, there are quite a few more males that, than females that are 30 to 35 pounds. And then there were five males that were 35 to 40 pounds, but no females that were that large. So you can see the average female is gonna be closer to the 20 to 30 range. And the average male, male is more gonna be maybe 25 to 35. But if you think about, you know, depending on what type of dog you have at home, uh, if you think about how much your dog weighs, that's quite different. Coyotes have a lot of fur, so they may look as big as a larger dog, but they definitely are not as big. And a lot of it's just fur and long legs. So my Labrador Retrievers, one of them is 60 pounds and one of them is 70 pounds. So really twice the size, at least in terms of weight, as a coyote. So let's talk a little bit about what coyotes do. Uh, they are very social, um, similar to our domesticated dogs. They, they do like to be around other coyotes. They like to talk to other coyotes. So they vocalize with yips and barks and howls. 
And I'm going to play a few of those for you in a minute. And they are very different from the sound of a wolf howling. Um, they Coyotes generally live as a mated pair. So as we see in this picture here, occasionally they will also live in a small family group, especially while the young coyotes are still maturing and getting ready to go off on their own. Um, this is sometimes when people ask me about, oh my gosh, I saw like three or four coyotes together. I was really nervous. I was afraid they were running as a pack. Well, here in this area of the country, they don't pack up. Um, if you see more than two coyotes together, you're basically seeing the mom and dad and a couple of the younger coyotes, which maybe if they're the same size, they may just be getting ready to go out on their own. Out in the West um, and in like the, the more Northern parts of our country in the West, they will sometimes pack up if they're eating larger animals during the winter because that's all they can find. And then they pack up because they're small animals and there's no other way for them to really bring down a larger animal like an elk, for instance. Um, so they will occasionally pack up in the West, but they aren't gonna do that here in Florida. Um, they also will often be solo too, especially if it's a young male who's sort of finding his own way and trying to figure out um, where he's going to live and find a female and things like that. You may see some solo coyotes. Out in the wild, they live about five to six years on average. The oldest known coyote that was from the wild was 12 years old. And then of course in captivity, because they're taken care of, they don't have as many threats to their survival. They're fed better, so they have better nutrition. Um, their longevity is going to be more. So the oldest known captive coyote was 19 years old. So five to six years, that's not a really long lifespan. All right, so um, we're gonna see if this works. I'm gonna to try to play you some coyote calls and we'll just cross our fingers with the technology. Okay, so you may not see anything, but you're gonna, hopefully gonna hear them in a second. So those were coyotes in a, so I'm going to stop sharing just for a second. Those were coyotes in captivity. They were actually in a zoo. So you could hear a lot of yipping and yapping and it's very high pitched. Um, so it's not maybe what you would have thought of if you've never heard them before. And then I'm going to play the next one for you as well. So um, that, that, those coyotes were in somebody's backyard. It was just a YouTube video that I found. Um, and you could hear a little bit more of the barking, some of the yipping, and then also a little bit of the howling. But it's not, it's not what I associate with what wolves sound like when they howl or even what my dogs sound like when they howl. So there's definitely, to me, a much higher pitch to coyotes usually. All right, here's our next poll for you guys. So, do you know how to tell if a coyote has been in your area? So, if you don't see a coyote, would you know how to tell if it's been in your backyard? All right, those boats are coming in. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the polling and share. 
Okay, so we've got one person that feels they definitely would know how to tell if a coyote has been in their backyard. We've got six people that are like, mm, maybe, possibly. And then we've got 67% of you that have no idea and are here for me to tell you more. And I am more than happy to do that. All right, so we are gonna look at some of the signs that coyotes leave behind. All right, here we go. So let's talk about coyote tracks because it, it may be possible that you think there's been a coyote in your backyard or in your area. It may be possible that you hear them one night and you're like, oh yeah, those are those sounds that Dr. Catherine was talking about. I think there's been a coyote around. So maybe you go out the next morning and you look and see if you can find other signs. So let's talk about track identification for a minute. So one of the first things to know when you're looking for coyote tracks is how to tell the basics of cat tracks from dog tracks. There's a couple generalities and they are generalities. They aren't hard and true rules. Um, but in general, cats are gonna retract their claws. So here we have a bobcat and notice you can look at the ruler. These are not sized um, so that you can compare the size from one to another, but you can see the ruler next to them. So here we have bobcat tracks and you can see that cat tracks usually don't show claws. Now they can, but generally they don't. And generally this hind pad here has three lobes right there. Okay. And then also generally um, we see a little asymmetry in the cat track. So you can see the toes aren't exactly the same side to side. Uh, so you might notice some asymmetry as well as if you look at the negative space between the pads on the foot, it looks a little bit different in a cat compared to a dog. So here's our coyote right below the bobcat. Um, coyote tracks are often pretty narrow compared to a cat or dog track. So our domestic dogs sort of are usually more spread out or splayed. Our coyote feet are quite narrow. Often you, with coyotes, you'll only see those top two nail marks or claw marks. You don't always see the lower toes, but you see there's a symmetry to this mark. And usually, like domestic dogs usually have just two lobes to that back pad there. Um, sometimes with coyotes, it will look like there's three lobes though. So once again, no rule is complete. Um, but this just gives us some ways to start looking at the differences in the tracks. Our <coughs> excuse me, the front is going to be about two and a quarter inches and the hind track is a little smaller usually at about two inches for an average adult. Um, remember wolf tracks are like twice the size of that. Not that we would have a wolf track in our backyard here in Florida, but just to give you a sense. So here again, here's some coyote tracks here. Um, and the pictures, once again, they have that triangular foot pad. Um, we may only see the top two claws and not all four, and your hind foot is a little bit smaller. So let's take a look at scat, that's always fun. So here's a picture of coyote scat, which is our scientific word for poop. So this is unusual coyote scat. Um, so anyone want to guess by typing into the chat box what this coyote was eating? And I'm gonna pull up the chat box so I can see what you guys guess. All right, I see, see a couple guesses in there. Anybody else wanna make a guess? How about I give you a clue? Think about, this is a coyote that was in a homeowners association here in Sarasota County. And they found this scat like right on the road in the HOA and sent me a picture of it. Think about what they might be eating in a neighborhood association in Florida. 
Maryland's close. Ooh, corn is interesting. That's a good guess too. All right, you guys are making some good guesses now, but none of you are quite right. There we go, Maryland's got it. All right, so this coyote was eating like the, the little berries or the fruit of the palm trees. And so if you're not from Florida, of course, we have lots of different palm trees down here, many of them even native. Um, but in this particular homeowners association, a lot of palm trees that were fruiting at that moment and they drop a ton of their little palm fruits onto the ground. They make a huge mess. And this coyote was just gorging on the palm fruits because coyotes will eat whatever they can find that is yummy and easy. And so normally in coyote scat, we would see the remnants of fur because coyotes are predators and they often will eat small rodents and rabbits and things like that. This coyote's excrement is quite light yellow. Normally it would be more, you know, brownish gray and it is full of those palm fruits. So it looks, it's also not as formed as it normally would be, just like if us humans eat too much fruit, that's what happens. So um, this is slightly different than what you would normally expect, but coyote scat will average about four inches long. It is often squared off on most ends like a log. So if you have a dog, just think about what your dog poop looks like. So it's usually like in a log, it might have squared off ends, and then there might be one piece that's more pinched off at the end. Typically it's gonna contain the hair of the prey that it ate, but once again, it's going to vary based on what the coyote was eating. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you guys can see me and I'm going to do a little show and tell. All right, are you ready? Here it is. Woo! All right, this is a, um, a sample of coyote scat. This is not real scat. So I just thought I'd give you a little 3D show and tell. This is actually a rubberized um, version of coyote scat made from a mold there. Now you know it's not real, but this is what it looks like. And so you can see it's sort of log-like, it's broken into chunks usually, and it's mostly squared off on the ends. Compared to bobcat scat, which once again, if you have a pet cat at home, you know what cat scat looks like. It will be in like sort of these more um, rounded sort of lobular forms and cat scat tends to be pinched off on every end, okay? And bobcats are a little bit smaller than coyotes, so their, their scat tends to be a little smaller as well. There we go. All right, let me show you the skull now. So this is, this is a replica skull of a coyote. So some of the things to notice are that coyotes like our domestic, like most of our domesticated dogs have snouts. So canines have, tend to have longer snouts because they really rely on their sense of smell. Eyes are forward in their skull because they are predators. So predators like us humans tend to have our eyes in the front because then we have greater depth perception. Prey animals like a rabbit will tend to have their eyes or a deer even will tend to have their eyes more on the side or the lateral aspect of their skull, which helps them have more peripheral vision, which is important if something's trying to eat you. But if you're a predator, you want to have that forward vision so that you know how far away your prey is and how fast you have to run or how far you have to jump to get you your prey. So let's take a look at the teeth. Let's look this way, I think. So this is a very typical predator dentition pattern. You have these really um, noticeable, prominent, and sharp canine teeth. You have um, your incisor teeth, which are up front here, still pretty sharp. And then even the molars, let's see, there we go. That molar right there, pretty sharp. If you run your teeth along the back or your tongue along the back of your teeth, along your molars, 
you, your molars have bumps on them, but they aren't super sharp like a predator's are. So just by looking at the teeth of a coyote, we know that this is a predator animal that uses that dentition to catch its prey and to eat the meat. Here's a bobcat skull. So similar sort of predator, predator dentition with those sharp canines. The incisors are a little bit smaller because cats really use those canines to puncture um, the neck and the spinal cord often. And then they still have, they have less um, molars, but they're still really sharp. And then they have that, those forward eyes. Notice that in a bobcat though, they don't have such a pronounced um, nostril or nasal area because they are gonna more use their sense of vision than their sense of smell. All right, so that's a little bit about skulls and scat. Let me go back to sharing the presentation for you. Okay. So we just looked at that dentition pattern in the coyote skull, which really shows that they are predators and coyotes are considered apex predators because of that dentition and because they don't really have a lot of predators them, that prey on them. Um, of course, humans are probably one of their greatest threats, but they don't have a lot of other animals. Wolves are predators to coyotes. Um, but we don't have wolves here in Florida. So coyotes don't have a lot of predators here. So even though their teeth are the dentition of a predator, really in practice, coyotes are omnivores. And that just means they'll eat anything. And they're not only omnivores, opportunistic omnivores, meaning they'll eat pretty much anything they can find. Sort of like if you came to my alligator presentation, that's what alligators do too. They just will try to find whatever is easiest that they're willing to eat. So our coyotes, they might eat berries like we talked about with the palm fruit um, or berries off of some of your bushes. They might eat insects. They'll eat small birds and small mammals. And then um, they'll eat larger ungulates like elk out west. And they'll even eat carrion, which is dead animals. And then of course they'll eat garbage. They're a little bit like a raccoon that way too. And this is partly why coyotes um, have so easily transitioned to being able to survive in suburban and urban environments, partially because they have such a generalist diet. So going back to that FWC study where they had those 149 coyote carcasses that they were able to find over a number of years and study them, one of the things they did is they looked at stomach contents to try to learn more about what coyotes in Florida are eating. So I'm gonna show you a few pictures. I took out the really gross pictures. So um, this is about as gross as it gets. This is a substantial amount of insects found in the stomach of coyote number 1052. And this was a coyote that was trapped at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola in 2012. And as you can see on the little tag right there, it says roaches. So this coyote was eating its stomach full of roaches. I think I see a little bit of grass in there. And other than that, it's all roaches. So they'll eat just about anything. Um, this is the overall study of all of the different coyotes that they looked at. So about 31% of their diet of those 149 coyotes were small mammals. 30%, so about the same amount of their diet was made up of vegetation, of them eating grass and other types of vegetation. 12% of their diet is insects. They had a small amount of birds in their diet. Herps are going to be your reptiles and amphibians, so that would be like a frog, um, and a small amount of fish in their diet as well. So let's look at this dark blue piece of the pie here. 10% was anthropogenic. So anthropogenic is just the fancy word for human cause. So that means 10% of the coyotes that they looked at in the study were getting their diet from human sources. So here's a picture of obvious dog food found in the stomach, actually of another, 
think that's a different coyote that was also trapped at the Naval Air Station. And then this was cooked chicken found in a coyote from Pinellas County. So they knew it was already cooked chicken, so they knew it was a human source. It's not that this coyote went out and found a living chicken to eat. No, it got into somebody's garbage, and this coyote got into somebody's who had left their dog food out. Um, here is a McDonald's butter wrapper that was found in one of the coyote stomachs. And look, somebody left their Easter egg candy out, and this coyote found a mini egg wrapper. Well, not just the wrapper. This coyote ate the chocolate and then the egg um, wrapper was found in its stomach. So this just goes to show that we are part of the problem in terms of coyotes interacting with humans. And so we'll talk in a few minutes about ways to minimize interactions, one of which is to make sure that you aren't um, feeding coyotes and not that you would purposely feed a coyote, but a lot of this is inadvertent feeding, like leaving dog food out or leaving cat food out or leaving your garbage um, in, a, in a vehicle in some sort of situation that an animal could get into. So we'll come back to that in a minute, but let's finish up with some of our natural history. So coyotes will um, reproduce once a year and they can start reproducing as early as their first year of life. Uh, they have about a two month gestation period before the pups are born and they average about six pups per litter, but it's just gonna depend on how healthy the female is, um, how, how well her nutrition was the year, be, the year leading up to um, breeding, and if she's not as healthy as she could be, she's probably going to have less pups. Uh, their eyes open in about 8 to 14 days after birth. They will eat solid food regurgitated by the adults at first, so the adults will go out and find food, and then they will regurgitate that for their pups. And the pups will venture out of wherever they were born in about three weeks and they can hunt on their own at five months, and then they will sort of try to disperse and find their own territory, their own place to live at about six to nine months of age because they will be coming up on the time where they're gonna be ready to find a mate and breed as well. With coyotes, both parents do care for the young because remember they live as a mated pair. So the male and female often will live together and once the pups are born, both will take care of the young. So um, no matter where or when I talk about coyotes, there's always a question that comes up about coyotes breeding with wolves, coyotes breeding with dogs. So it is physically possible for coyotes to breed with both wolves and dogs. In fact, um, as coyotes moved across our country from the west to the east, we do think that they initially did breed with wolves. Um, and we do also have evidence of them being able to breed with dogs, but these are not common things. Uh, the, the breeding time, like when a female dog and a female coyote go into heat are very different. Um, so usually these hybridizations don't occur unless they're sort of forced by humans or forced because there isn't a, an appropriate mate of the same species. So for instance, as coyotes moved across um, the country into the eastern part of our country, if they didn't find another coyote yet because the coyote populations hadn't increased, yes, maybe they would, they would mate with a female dog that was in heat or maybe with a wolf. Um, but generally, this is not going to happen. They're going to want to mate with their own species. And this is just a little historical background of genetically how these different species of canines sort of separated out. There was an ancestral canid about one to two million years ago. And the gray wolf and what would become the coyote and the red wolf sort of separated out at that point genetically. Um, the red wolf is more closely related to the coyote, and those two separated out genetically about 150 to 300,000 years ago. And there are my cute little dogs right there on the bottom um, that separated out. Oh, I don't know if I, I might have gotten rid of the time right there. 
um, but they separated out from the gray wolf um, quite a while back as well. So they are closely, they are all related. They can interbreed as we just mentioned, but it is unusual for that to happen. And they've done genetic DNA studies and um, looked into this issue. And there are, the studies do show that there's a percentage of dog and wolf DNA in coyotes to varying degrees. But we do think that this happened, you know, a, lo a relatively longer time ago and isn't happening on a normal basis. All right, so let's talk about their home ranges. So nat in natural areas, coyotes will range about 15 square miles. In urban areas, um, they've done a lot of research in Chicago because there are a lot of coyotes that are living in the suburban and urban areas around Chicago. And when they looked at how far coyotes ranged and they did this by um, putting the GPS collars on them and being able to follow them and track where they went, um, most of the urban coyotes were only traveling within about a three square mile area. Anyone want to guess in the chat box why the difference between natural and urban areas? I'm going to look at my chat. Okay, roads, availability of food. Road, yep. So generally food is the variable that is cited in this difference in that urban areas, coyotes don't have to travel as far for food because we leave a bunch of food that's easy for them to access. So they don't really have to go that far. Um, I think roads is a good consideration as well. Um, if they have enough food, they're not gonna travel any further than necessary. And they're gonna try to stay away from roads as much as possible. Um, so I think that those are both variables. Great. Um, coyotes do prefer, in terms of natural areas, they prefer wooded areas with dense cover, but they are very, very adaptable. Um, they're adaptable with their diet. They have a small body size, so they are very adaptable in terms of where they can move and hiding and being able to get through, um, you know, shrubbery and things like that. And they're also, they're very smart. They're very cunning. So they also can keep themselves safe um, by hiding and moving around at times where they're least likely to be seen depending on where they are. So coyotes were not naturally in Florida. They are not considered a native species to Florida. So you can see on the map here that this darker orange area vertically across North America here, this was the coyote historic range before 1700. They started to move both east and west. First they moved east in like the 1800s and then, or sorry, that's the west. First they moved west in the 1800s and then they started moving into the east in the early to mid 1900s. And a lot of this was due to uh, wolves being hunted at, because wolves were their main predator that kept them, sorry, that kept them um, in a historical range. And once the wolves were starting to be removed, especially from the East Coast, that allowed coyotes to move into areas that they hadn't been in before. So we call this naturalized. When a species moves of its own accord into new areas, we don't consider that an exotic or non-native species. We consider it naturalized because they're moving on their own, um, although that is often due secondarily to factors that humans have caused. So um, as I just mentioned, they started to expand their range mostly because of the eradication of wolves but also because of conversion of forested landscapes into pasture and agricultural lands, which coyotes love and wolves don't love so much. Um, so this was just another factor that made things more um, exciting and habitable to coyotes. Uh, once again, they are generalists, so they also easily adapt. They also have a large litter size, so as they're trying to expand their range or moving into new areas, they may lose a pup or two, but there's usually going to be a couple more pups in that litter that are going to allow the population to expand. 
And this is just some University of Florida data from Dr. Marty Main. Um, this map just gives you an indication based on some of the research that was done. These are the different research studies and the years that they looked at. And you can see it looks for the most part that coyotes started to come in, which would make sense from um, the more northwest area of our state up in the Panhandle. And then they started to move down into the Panhandle. And then eventually by 2011, they were even located in the Keys. So just to give you a little sort of context about coyotes here in Sarasota County, um, the, this is information from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that takes, uh, takes calls about coyotes. Now, most of these calls are basically going to be about nuisance or potential problem coyotes. So it's not really giving us an indication of population. There really is no way to know the population of coyotes here in Sarasota County. Um, but it gives us an idea of how often people are concerned about coyotes in our county. Uh, we also have some statewide numbers here. So you see the 2016 and 17 data, we have a jump in calls from Sarasota County, even though the statewide totals stayed about the same, Sarasota doubled its calls in 2017 about coyotes to the FWC. And really my FWC contact felt like this was mostly due to the fact that here in Venice, I'm really close to Venice right now, which is just south of Sarasota. And in Venice, we were seeing at least one coyote, maybe multiple coyotes that looked like they had mange. And people were really concerned about the health of the coyotes. So they were calling um, FWC to report this animal. Um, in 2018, I, when I collected the data, it was in December, so I didn't have the full year yet, but we had 63 or a little bit more, so probably pretty consistent. And we had some indication of what the calls were about. So 50% of the calls were just a general call about, oh, I saw a coyote in somebody's yard, or uh, could you tell me a little bit more about coyotes? 29% were more related to coyotes that were sick or injured, and 21% of those calls were in reference to nuisance behavior. So even when we see calls coming in about coyotes, if this year is any indication, about maybe one-fifth or one-fourth of those calls are about a nuisance coyote, which isn't very many. Um, Sarasota County tends to be about the eighth highest um, county in terms of calls about coyotes to the FWC. Uh, I know this, the last year or two, I haven't gotten as many calls because some of those calls end up coming to me too, if people are concerned. Um, but I know in 2017 and 2018, I was doing a lot of coyote education. All right. So let's look at a few myths or maybe truths about coyotes. We're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then we're gonna talk about what you can do to minimize interactions with coyotes and we'll have some time for questions. So coyotes, um, they do provide aesthetic value for people that do find them beautiful and enjoy wildlife viewing. Um, and if you don't feel that way about coyotes, they provide an important ecological service as well. They are a predator, so they will manage some of the small and medium-sized predators and rodents that you may really not want to have in your yard. So they will, they will eat raccoons, they'll definitely eat mice and rats, they would probably rather eat a rat than a raccoon, um, and they will also eat rabbits too. And if you're from Sarasota County, I love rabbits and there are a lot of them here in Sarasota County. So we can pretty much guarantee just by the amount of rabbits that I see on a nightly basis that even if there are coyotes here, the rabbit population is gonna survive. We might lose some individuals, um, but the coyotes are never gonna wipe out our rabbit population. They will still be here. So the coyotes help to balance the ecosystem because I also get calls about people that are upset about rabbits eating their gardens and their plants. So if there's too many rabbits, that's a problem as well. And the coyotes help to manage and keep our ecosystem in balance. 
This is just a little information uh, about the economic impact of wildlife viewing. People come to our state specifically to view wildlife. It is the second most popular outdoor recreation activity um, after our beaches. So of course we all know people come here for the beaches, but lots of people come here to view wildlife. Um, they aren't necessarily coming exactly just to see coyotes. A lot of people are coming here for birding or coming here to go out and see wildlife by kayaking and hiking and things like that. But wildlife is really important to our economy. And so we don't ever wanna take a species out of our ecosystem even if it's a species that we personally have a hard time with because that has ramifications throughout the whole ecosystem. And so coyotes are an important part of that balance. So some of the things they do that we may not like as much is yes, they may prey on eggs and adult birds such as our songbirds, quail, ducks, um, or the eggs of some of our larger wading birds. Um, once again, they have a very varied diet so they are not seeking out bird nests just to eat the eggs, but if they came across a bird nest with eggs and they were hungry, they might eat a few. They might also um, predate upon valued wildlife, like some of our rare or endangered wildlife. But once again, this is not a common behavior. And a lot of times I get questions about the sea turtle nests. And usually that is just a learned behavior of a single coyote that somehow that coyote has figured out or learned that there's sea turtle eggs if they dig up the nest in the beach. And maybe I know like in Lido Beach, I think there was a coyote that was doing this a few years back. Um, so what, what the researchers have seen is that really that's a learned behavior and that's not a common behavior. So sometimes it's just a matter of removing that single coyote that has um, developed some negative learned behavior. And that's true in terms of livestock as well. And sometimes people ask me, well, what about our native predators like panthers and bobcats and fox? Do coyotes compete with them and limit their populations? Um, and what we have seen in research is that this is not true, that their ranges and territories may overlap to some degree with bobcats and fox, but they generally are out at different times of the day and so aren't competing um, for food as much as we might think. So these are some of the things that people either have fear about or some serious concerns about. And some of these things do happen, but perhaps not to the, the extent that you might think. So there is some concern about coyotes predating on livestock and also on some of our crops like watermelons. They do like fruit. Um, once again, as I said in the previous slide, this tends to be a learned behavior of um, a single coyote and not the norm. And also sometimes what we find happening is that um, coyotes might be seen around a dead calf, for instance, and they are seeing the carrion, they are eating the animal after it has already died, and they are not the cause of the animal's death. And so we have to be careful with making those assumptions, and the University of Florida actually has information for ranchers that helps them determine what might have killed their animal if that has occurred. We're going to see a quick movie on how coyotes do or do not impact your population in a minute. Um, people are always concerned about coyotes and their pets. Now this is a relevant concern if you have a small pet. So I showed you pictures of the types of animals that coyotes will eat. They will eat raccoons and rabbits. So if you have a cat or a small dog that is the size of those smaller wildlife, then it is possible that a coyote would mis mistake your pet for some smaller wildlife that it might eat. So you do want to be careful with that. Your small dog should be kept on a leash. You should stay um, close to your small dogs. Your cat should stay inside because it's healthier for your cat and it's healthier for wildlife if your cats are not outside. And we'll talk in a second about there are some diseases that coyotes can carry. Most of them are not going to be transferred easily to your pets um, or certainly not to you as well. 
All right. Oh, we're going to we're going to watch. You know what? We're running out of time. We are going to skip this video. Um, Adelaide, can you put the link to this video in the chat box and that way people will have it if they want to watch it? Um, basically, the outcome of this video, this um, is a scientist talking about the research of whether or not coyotes limit deer populations. And basically, the outcome of that research was no, coyotes do not limit um, the deer population. They might take a sick small deer or a young deer occasionally, but there is not enough of that that happens that would actually affect the deer population. And then I know people always ask me about being bitten by a coyote. So usually the biggest fears are if I see a coyote, what do I do? Is it going to bite me? And is it going to hurt my dog if I'm walking my dog at night? So this slide just gives you a little bit of the actual statistics, which really indicate that if we put things into context, yes, there have been situations where coyotes have bitten humans. Um, and in 46 years, there's actually been two fatalities. But if you compare that to the amount of dog bites, it is so minuscule and the risk is so very low. So it is highly unusual and very rare that a coyote actually would bite a person. And usually this is a situation where the coyote feels scared or cornered. It's not that a coyote becomes aggressive and bites someone. Um, whereas you can see the numbers for dogs and I'm a dog person, so I don't like to show dogs in a bad light, but dog bites are much more common than anything we would come upon with a coyote. <clears throat> All right, we'll do a quick poll. This is my last question to ask you guys. So do you feel confident and what to do if you were to encounter a coyote. You went out in your backyard right now and there was a coyote standing there. Do you know what to do? Oh, I've got a bunch of people saying yes. Love it. Okay. A few more votes coming in. All right, I'm going to end the polling and we'll share the results. So good. Most of you definitely feel like you know what to do if you encountered a coyote. That's great because when we feel confident in what we would do, then we have less concern and less fear. <clears throat> We've got a couple people that would turn and run, which I will tell you in a second is the absolute worst thing to do. So don't do that. So we'll, we'll change your mindset on that right now. And we've got a couple people who don't know what to do. So we're going to cover that right now. All right. Did that leave from your screen, Adelaide, the poll? Okay. Good. All right. So our last few slides. You want to prevent problems by minimizing your interaction with coyotes. So here's a coyote in the West Chase area in Tampa that was on the news the other day um, in a golf course around somebody's neighborhood. Uh, interestingly, this coyote is very dark. So like I said, there can be a lot of variety in their coloration. So you want to never feed coyotes because just like with alligators and many of our other wildlife, once an animal associates humans with an easy source of food, what are they gonna do? They're smart, they're gonna hang around humans. So they're gonna lose their natural fear of us and they're gonna hang around because they're like, last time I was hanging around here, there was just food for me. So why would I go do what I'm normally supposed to do? That takes a lot more energy. I'm just gonna hang around the humans. So you wanna secure your garbage and your compost. Think about your compost. You wanna clean up any pet food. Don't leave pet food outside, but also think about fallen fruit and bird seed. So bird seed that falls out of your feeder, fruit that falls from your tree and starts to ferment on the ground. What an easy, delicious meal for the coyote. You wanna keep your cats indoors. And if you have a dog, so like I said, if they're small dogs, you want to keep them le on leashes and you want to supervise them. You don't want to just let them out in your backyard because they know to come back in. You want to stay out there with them if you think there's a coyote in the area. And coyotes love chickens, so you want to monitor and secure backyard chickens if you have chickens. 
And you want to close off crawl spaces under buildings so that that isn't a nice, easy place for a coyote to hide or take a nap. So don't allow them to get accustomed to us. So we're going to talk about, I am going to show this video quickly, hopefully. We're going to talk about how to haze a coyote, which is the number one thing you should do. All right, are you seeing the video, Adelaide, or no? Probably not. I think you have to reshare. Yeah, here we go. Uh, and also a reminder to start it at 35 seconds in. All right, we'll see if it's going to load for us. And if not, we will move on. Hold on. Observing a coyote in your area isn't necessarily a cause for concern. When coyotes associate places where people live and work with an easy place to find food, they can become accustomed to people and gradually lose their natural fear of humans. You can significantly reduce or avoid potential conflicts with coyotes by securing food attractants such as garbage or pet food near your home. Coyotes are curious but timid and will generally run away if challenged. You can scare or haze them if you feel comfortable doing so. Waving your arms, yelling, and acting aggressively will usually cause a coyote to retreat. It may take increased and continued hazing to deter the coyotes completely. You may also need to vary hazing methods so the coyote does not become accustomed to them. Other hazing methods include throwing small stones or sticks towards but not directly at a coyote to encourage the animal to leave. Go! Using noisemakers such as a coyote shaker made from sealing pebbles or coins in an empty Go drink away! container. Spraying water from a hose or motion activated sprinkler. Waving a golf club umbrella Go or stick away! above your Go! head to make yourself look larger. Go! Opening an Go! umbrella in the direction of the Go animal, away! the sound and action of the Get umbrella opening Go is away! a good option to haze coyotes. Get! Depending on proximity and wind direction, bear spray can also be effective. If you're with a small pet, pick them up and hold them securely before hazing a coyote. Keep your distance and avoid injuring the coyote. The goal is to scare the animal away, not injure it. Never haze a coyote if it appears sick or injured, if there are young pups present, or if the animal is cornered with no place to run away. Injured animals can be more dangerous and may attempt to protect themselves or their young if threatened. By securing attractants and pets and hazing coyotes, you can significantly reduce conflicts with them in your community. All right, let's finish up so you guys have some time for questions. Okay, so just a review of the different hazing methods that you saw in the video. It's a great video, really. You just wanna make yourself tall and loud and big um, because coyotes are very curious, um, just like many dogs are. It's just a, it's a part of their um, sort of genetics that they're curious, but they should be afraid of us. So you just wanna be loud, you wanna scream, you wanna wave your arms. Um, all those different things that they showed in the video. Now, if you have a larger dog with you, um, that coyote may either see your larger dog as a threat um, or they may want to play with your larger dog. So if you are out walking a larger dog, you want to stand in front of your larger dog before you start hazing. If it's a small dog, then like in the video, you want to pick it up and hold on to your small dog. So you never want to run because a coyote is going to take that as a sign of like playfulness 
And then they may chase after you, not because they're being aggressive, because that's what you might think that, oh my gosh, now they're chasing me, but they are probably going to see it as an attempt to play with them. So never run. In fact, as you saw in the video, you might actually want to walk towards them as you're hazing them. Um, some of the diseases that coyotes carry, they can have mange, like I talked about the one in Venice. This is a skin condition caused by parasitic mites. It spreads via direct contact. So, and it usually only affects animals who are already sick or weak. Um, so it's unlikely that a coyote would be able to give your dog mange unless your dog and, coyote and the coyote were playing together and your dog already had a depressed immune system. So that's not, it could happen, but it's not really concern. They can also carry rabies, uh, but the main vector in Florida for rabies is raccoons. It's, there's only been two cases in Florida of coyotes with rabies in the past 20 years. So it's also not common at all. But of course you always wanna have your dogs, cats, and even your ferrets vaccinated against rabies. Um, especially if your dog goes outside by themselves. Here are some of the numbers to contact if you have specific concerns. So the FWC does have a wildlife alert hotline, which is 1-888-404-FWCC. Um, that's, that's one of the hotlines where we got that call information from. So if you saw a coyote with concerning behavior, you could call the wildlife alert hotline. And you wouldn't necessarily call this number just because you saw a coyote because coyotes are in all 67 counties in the state of Florida. If you had any concerns about rabies, usually that's the county health department that you would contact in your county. If you wanna learn more information about coyotes or who to contact if a coyote does have concerning behavior, you can go to the FWC website, which is myfwc.com. Um, it is a little difficult sometimes to find what you're looking for. So we showed some pictures. Once you're on their main website page, you would click on resolve a wildlife con conflict. It brings up this drop down menu and you'll see coyotes right there and click on coyote. And then it'll take you to a page that looks like this and it has lots of information about coyotes on it if you wanna learn more. Um, but it also at the bottom of the page has all this additional resources and information in both English and there's some Spanish ones as well. Living with coyotes will take you to more information about what to do in terms of reporting unusual coyote behavior. I think the hazing video was also on this uh, page as well. And there are call contacts for the different, the five different regions in Florida, or you can just call the wildlife alert hotline. And then I'm gonna end with, um, it doesn't always, well, it rarely makes sense to trap coyotes or try to remove them from an area. The reality is, and they've done research on this, that you just cannot get rid of coyotes in an area that they have already populated. If you remove a coyote, then there's going to be another coyote that's likely to come into that and take the place of the coyote that was there. So if you have a coyote that has unusual or concerning behavior or is sick, then yes, that might be a reason to remove that coyote. Um, but if it's a coyote that's just going about doing its coyote things and it's not bothering humans, it's not, um, it's not endangering pets or livestock, then you might wanna just leave that coyote be because if you remove that coyote, another coyote with worse behavior might actually take its place. So this is true with some of our other wildlife that I often get calls about like armadillos and snakes. There are armadillos everywhere. If you remove an armadillo, probably just another one's gonna come into your yard because something in your yard is inviting that wildlife. So a lot of it then comes back to what can we do to make our yards less hospitable to some of this wildlife that maybe we don't want in our yard. Um, so with coyotes, you go back to thinking about what have I done to make my yard really happy and fun for a coyote? Am I leaving garbage where they can get it? Am I leaving food out? Am I leaving fruit on the ground from my fruit tree? And remove some of those attractants that might be bringing a coyote into your yard. 
but the reality is they might also just be passing through too. My email is there. If you need anything, you can send me an email if you have any questions. And if I can't answer them, I'll send it along to the right person who hopefully can.